so let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Kapoor before I move on to other things, because I want to make sure we all can appreciate his wisdom and expertise. Uh, originally from India, Dr. Kapoor made his mark at Fresno State in 1967. Now, Dr. Kapoor, I won't mention when I was born, um, but it might be around that same time period. So, um, but he, at that point, he began teaching social work courses at Fresno State, and he has since earned emeritus status for his lifetime of teaching in the department. 55 years later, he still teaches at the university, which I think is his own special celebration. Now he's, he provides uh, great service to the Department of Philosophy. Dr. Kapoor has founded and directed Fresno State's Peace and Conflict Studies program and helped create the beautiful Peace Garden at Fresno State in the early 90s. Dr. Kapoor has created a legacy throughout his amazing career, and we are so honored to hear from him tonight. Let's give him a warm welcome by unmuting yourself and giving a great round of applause for our expert panelists tonight. Congratulations. Moderating tonight's conversation is Gay Bianas, a second year Master of Social Work student and a nominee of the Honorable Dean's Medalist Award for the College of Health and Human Services. Gabe earned his recognition because of his academic excellence, fantastic leadership, and passion for the social work profession. When he graduates next month, Gabe aspires to be a mental health clinician, a role that will allow him to advocate and serve others. Like Dr. Kapoor, Gabe has also studied violence in America and most recently developed and hosted a workshop on campus to bring awareness of the violence that affects families and communities in the U.S. He is just fantastic, and we are happy to have him join us tonight. Let's all unmute and give a warm round of applause to welcome Gabe to the to the screen. Thank you, Gabe. Thank you. Thank you. Get away. Thank you, Dr. Siebert, for that wonderful introduction. And before I begin, I just want to give a quick word of appreciation to Beth Wilkinson, Amy Mills, and of course, Dr. Siebert for coordinating this event, inviting me to participate. I'm very honored to be a part of this. But now let's turn to the man of the hour, Dr. Kapoor. Dr. Kapoor, it's great to see you. How are you doing? Fine. Thank you very much, Gabriel. It's great. Wonderful to, see wonderful to have an angel, actually, amongst us. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dr. Kapoor, you and I have met a few times, but it's an honor to be able to participate in this with you, an interview with you. So, um, with your permission, I'd like to begin asking you a few questions and we'll see where this takes us, okay? You are most welcome. Thank you so much. I will try, I will try my best. <laughs> so would you mind giving us some insight into your career goals? How did you go from political science to social work to philosophy? And how has the practice of social work as a vocation shaped your life? That's a very good question, Gabe. Uh, so far as my career goals are concerned, I am at a stage now, I don't have any future career goals. Uh, I think I have uh, uh, earned actually, I am professor emeritus. I have been a full professor for many, many years on the campus. So I love and enjoy teaching. Altogether, probably more than 60 plus years I have been in the teaching profession, including my years at Fresno State. More than half, almost half of, the, of my life I have been at Fresno State teaching in social work, now in philosophy department. Yes, I was pretty active in politics at one time, but there came a change in my life that politics is not uh, what actually is the best direction or a goal for me. I came in touch with somebody who was very close to Mahatma Gandhi. He said, go and serve the villages. This is where India lives. That was quite an advice that I got. And I did, send, send, I did spend some time in the villages, living with poor people, staying with them, eating with them, and knowing what they are going through. Their way of life actually was a great lesson in my life. But I also heard stories from them 
that these politicians only come when there's an election to get votes. The rest of the year, they don't show up, they don't do anything. Hmm. So I just thought that that is not a good profession at all. So I decided to move actually from politics to social work. So that is the big change in my life. And I think uh, I made the best decision to be involved in social work and not go to politics. If I had stayed in India at present, I have a feeling there would have been a strong temptation to get involved into politics because a lot of my friends are still very active in politics in India at present. But I feel pretty good uh, inside me that I chose a profession which was a kind of a calling to me, not just a vocation, a profession is a calling, as you know, the meaning of the word calling like that over there. Now I teach in philosophy department. I'm not a philosopher by academic standards, but I do certainly enjoy the company of great philosophers in their department because the program that I started in 84 in peace and conflict studies is now housed in philosophy department. So they asked me to come and teach. So I am teaching one class, which is peace building class and I enjoy that very much. Each semester, I have a very good attendance in my class. And uh, this is how my connection is with the philosophy. But I certainly enjoy the company of great philosophers in their department. It's a very nice bunch of people and who are very enlightened. And I really have a great respect for them. And I learn from them also. I wonder if it's too late for me to change my major. So maybe I can take a class, a philosophy class of yours. <laughs> maybe next time. Tell me, Dr. Kapoor, what was your family like? I read your bio and saw that you credited your teachers and Mahatma Gandhi as enormous inspirations. But what values were instilled in you at a young age by those closest to you? Well, Gabe, I grew up in a very middle class family. And they, my parents were not rich or not very rich, I should say, but they tried their best to provide what I needed. I am really thankful to them, whatever they could give. And the most important thing is the guidance that I got from my parents and also grandparents. I lived in a joint family. In India, there is still actually a tradition where grandparents, parents, and grandchildren, they are living together. My father, was. there were five brothers and five sisters. Can you imagine they all living together like that? So I kind of miss that kind of a, uh, because you have a big, large you know, people actually around you all the time, uncles and aunts and other nephews and nieces, actually, so it's a great joy actually to be growing up in a joint family. So that is something that I miss very much, like that uh, I, I, it was a great uh, experience to, see, to be with other people around like that over there. The values that I got from my grandparents and parents, hard work, which no doubt is very important for every young man to grow up, and also other things, the respect for elders. That is something actually part of our culture also, respect for other people and particularly for the elders. Now, for example, early in the morning, I remember when I would get up before going to school, I would go and get the blessings from my grandparents. Touch their feet, that is the tradition actually, you touch their feet and get the blessings actually so that the rest of the days goes well. So respect for Elders and respect for others was very important value that I got. Another important thing, value that I got from my mother was respect all the other faiths and religions. Because she was very much involved in various faiths in the, in the town where I was growing up. I saw her going to the Sikh temple, to the Hindu temple, and other sects actually. She was actually attending all these kind of things. I think I got my first lesson in interfaith from my mother actually. And she used to say, if you don't like something about another faith, do not say any bad word. Always show respect. Do not say any bad word. So that is something very important that I have kept in my life like that. 
those are some of the values that I still carry, hard work, respect for elders, and particularly respect for other faiths and tradition. And which I think is a great need for all of us to live together, that various faiths and tradition, they are all, all the faiths and tradition has something very rich to contribute to our life. Only thing is we have to open our hearts to learn from them. Wow, I appreciate that you mentioned that. You mentioned respect for elders, respect for other faiths. Um, some of these challenges or requirements of living in a multicultural society such as us here in America. I know this, Dr. Kapoor, your, your sweater has the peace logo on it. How did you end up studying the practice of peace? Well, that goes way back to my young years and I was growing up. You know, Gandhi has been, a, as you mentioned also, Gandhi has been a very, very major influence in my life. And uh, he taught and practiced himself nonviolence. I consider nonviolence another name for love and peace. So it was his influence actually that had kept me going in my life, to be very honest. So I learned about peace and nonviolence from his life and his struggles and whatever he could do to emancipate India from the British rule, that was quite a big lesson actually that I have learned from him. And that's what I have been carrying on in my life, trying my best. It is very difficult to follow Gandhi, let me tell you. He was a very hard teacher and a lot of expectations actually he had. It's not easy to follow Gandhi actually, but I try my best like that. So this is how actually I learned about peace and nonviolence from him and his life. That's what he did in his life. So that has become a part of my life actually. Thank you, Dr. Kapoor. Another follow-up question to that, I mean, with all the conflict in the, in the world, how do you believe peace can be achieved? How can we practice peace in our everyday lives? Well, that's no doubt a very good question, a very hard question also. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. But so far as the global peace is concerned, it's not easy to achieve that. You need many, many Gandhis, you need many, many Dr. Kings, you need many, many Nelson Mandela, Mother Teresa and Dalai Lama, almost everywhere to have those kinds of people around us like that. So you need a, a galaxy of such leaders actually in the world who could really promote and work together to bring peace. That is very difficult mission, but I think we can bring peace in our own personal life because we control our own life. And that's what actually I have shared with my students. You may not be able to bring global peace or peace in the whole world, but certainly you can bring peace in your own life and immediate environments. And this is what I think I emphasize how to do that? Well, uh, every day actually when I get up, I, I touch the Mother Earth and seek blessings actually from the Lord actually and from Mother Earth actually. And also I expect that my students also follow that and everybody can follow that, that you can be the change that you wish to see. So that is actually the first mantra that I think I could share with all of you and others who are listening, that you have to be a role model. That's what I have been trying myself, trying to be a role model for others. First of all, it, I have to practice in my own self. I don't say that I have become a perfect person, no. I still have work to do actually. I still have to do a lot of things actually to improve myself. But I am gl glad that I have a partner in my life, my wife, whom I have been married for the last 57 plus years. And she has been a great influence. She has kept me on track. She is a very, very peaceful person. She meditates. She gets up actually early in the morning at three o'clock or 3.30 and goes into meditation for hours. So brings a very powerful vibration in the house and affects all of us particularly me. So I really learned about peace and meditation from her. 
So I think that's one thing that I would recommend that everybody should learn a little bit about meditation in their own life. For so that will make you a little bit more peaceful and helps you to be a very positive person actually. So be a positive person and think positive and do not do any harm to any other person. So that's what I have learned from my religion, from my faith. Do not do any harm to any other human being or any other living being. So that's very important actually. So that's how I think we can bring peace first in our own life. I always say peace begins with me. And that's the slogan in our home also, also that peace begins first at home with me and then it actually spreads outside actually like that. So that's the advice I can give that you be the peaceful person and have a peace in your own life first and then it will spread others to other people also. Start small and hopefully it snowballs into something bigger. That's, than that's very good. That's very correct. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Kapoor. How did the idea of the Peace Garden at Fresno State come about? Well, that's a little long story. <laughs> and let me say in brief, what happened that one day I got an invitation from a young man who is an artist and also a student in the art department. He asked me, Dr. Kapoor, I want you to come and visit me in my studio. And that was in the art department. So I accepted his invitation and went over there to see him. And what I saw actually on his table, he had a big mold of Gandhi. And he has been working on it for quite some time. And he showed me that. I first asked him, how did you start actually? He said, Dr. Poor, you were giving a lecture in one of the classes on Dr. King and Gandhi. After listening to the lecture, I decided that I want to do something. So he started working on the mold. Probably it was his idea to have something like that on the campus. So when he was showing and discussing me, discuss, discussing with me the mold that he had prepared, Gandhi's big mold. Then I asked him after that, before I left, what are you going to do with it? He said, Doc, I am not going to do anything with it. You are going to do with it. Well, I got the lesson. I understood what he meant that. So then I came and talked to my students about it. They listened. Well, nothing happened. But what happened around the same time, I happened to have a request to Cesar Chavez that I would like to bring my students to meet with you so that you could give them a uh, seminar on Gandhi and nonviolence. So he accepted and he said, hey, Dr. Poor, I have just 15 minutes only. I said, we will take it. I knew that it is good to get even 10 minutes with Cesar Chavez. So I took my students, he gave a seminar. Well, to be very brief, the seminar was so uplifting and thrilling to my students. The seminar lasted more than one hour and 15 minutes. So though he gave 15 minutes, he could not get out because my students started asking all these good questions. So the discussion and the conversation was going on and on and on. He could not get out of it. <laughs> but after that seminar that he gave, my students were so uplifted. And when they came back home, to the campus, they decided the next day they are going to do something. So I had shared with them about the Gandhi's uh, mold that the student was doing. He said, Dr. Poor, we are going to take it as a project. So those who are the students in my class who were taking this class on Gandhi and nonviolence, and they, boy, they were so inspired. Actually, they were inspired more by Siddhar Chavez actually after listening to him. because. Mm -hmm. Cesar Chavez talked quite a bit about Gandhi and his and Gandhi's influence on him. And that had inspired the students very much so like that. So the students actually were ready to do something. And some of them were at the student senate at that time in ASI. And they wrote a proposal. They asked me also to come back, to come with them. And we presented their proposal to the student senate. 
And you know what happened? After listening to us, student Senate gave us a $15,000. That was a great contribution that came from ASI at that time. And so, well, that was the beginning. Then I went to the faculty in the art department and they said, Dr. Pui, don't worry, we will give labor of love. We won't charge anything, we will work on it. And then I asked him that how much it will cost. So they gave me the figure. So I had 15,000 and they gave me the figure that in $25,000 they can do something like that. So I raised the rest of the $10,000 in the community so I had $25,000 then gave them the grand, green signal and boy, they work. And the faculty in the art department, I really very thankful to them. We put their names and the students and the plaque, which is right behind Gandhi's statue. We recognize them actually. So the students from the art class and the faculty gave labor of love and they were really the responsible for the statue. It's a student's project basically. I just actually facilitated and went around talking about it, but the real credit goes to the students in my class, the students in the art department and the faculty in the art department who work actually, and particularly their student who really got this idea. So this is the story actually. Then we invited Arun Gandhi from South Africa to inaugurate in, in, in 1990. So that's how this statue of Gandhi was inaugurated in 1990. It was a big event on the campus all about two, 3,000 people were there wow. on the campus. Like our ambassador came and uh, the, the community leaders came, president was there. Oh, it was a big event actually on the campus itself. Like the, we, I still have pictures of that event and celebration like that. Hmm. That's how actually the, 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 Gandhi, uh, the Gandhi statue came. And soon after that, my friends actually, Oh, from the Hispanic uh, uh, faculty and students, they wanted something also to be uh, done on the campus like that. Now, after Cesar Chavez passed away, we wanted to honor him also. So that's how the faculty and students got inspired. And it was the, again, the students were very active. Faculty and students got together and I was there with them. So we got Cesar Chavez statue installed in 96. And we invited Paul Chavez actually to come and that was another big event. So then after that, black students and faculty, they wanted something also. I said, well, let's go for it. So long as uh, there, there is a leadership. So we, we had the black students and faculty in front and I was also involved by this. Then that was another, then Dr. King's daughter, Yolanda King, Jalana King, she came and inaugurated the memorial oh. like that. Yeah. So we had these three, we had Gandhi, Cesar Chavez, Dr. King statue. Then I had a complaint from my women students and faculty on the campus. How come there is no women of peace on the peace garden? I said, well, sisters, if you are ready to give a leadership, provide leadership, I will work with you. So they were very much surprised. They came, they were very angry that there is no women of peace. Well, after listening to me, that if you provide the leadership, I will work with you. Mm -hmm. Well, that's in short. And they asked me to be the chair of the committee. I said, no, you have to be the leader. You have to be the chair of the committee. I worked as a co-chair. And that's how the, then we raised $100,000 for the Jane Adams statue, Women of Peace. That's another mm -hmm. story how Jane Adams statue were decided to be in short, that was the result of the students and faculty also. So the Peace Garden is basically, is the result of students' efforts and faculty on the campus. It really belongs to the students, to the faculty. I may have been the facilitator, but really credit goes to the students and faculty and the administration. Because when these things were happening, we had wholehearted support from the president to the vice president, from the deans, you just name it. Everybody actually was along actually. We yeah. never had any problem and mm -hmm. things moved very smoothly. And uh, we got the permission right from the chancellor's office to go ahead for the peace garden. That's what we have actually. And we are hoping to have Nelson Mandela pretty soon installed actually on the campus. I hope that comes pretty soon That's within amazing. a year or so. 
So not, not only is it the legacy of MLK and Gandhi and Cesar Chavez, Jane Addams, one day maybe um, Nelson Mandela, but it's also the legacy of the students. It's the legacy of you. As much as you're uh, wanting to distance yourself and not take all the credit, I think um, you know that's going to be a lasting statement of just your impact here in, in our campus community. So thank you again. With the Top Dog Arthur Safstrom Award, you're being recognized for your accomplishments as a distinguished faculty member, as well as a community leader. What has been your philosophy towards such effective and inspirational, inspirational leadership? Well, that's again, very interesting question. My philosophy of leadership actually is listen and listen actively. And not only actually try to be the leader all the time, you have to learn how to be a followers also. And show respect to all those who are around you and work with them in a very collective manner. It is a collective wisdom and collective leadership actually that makes things happen mm -hmm. like that. And that's what I have been trying to follow actually like that. You will have some problems, you will have some difficulties, but they, are, they should be considered as challenges actually like that. I have, whatever I have done on this campus, it is all with cooperation and collaboration of uh, all the people around me like that. Without that, it won't happen like that. Yes, there are difficult people around sometimes, you run into them. Hmm. Well, there are no mean people, there are no bad people. That's what my philosophy has been. There are good people, only times when there are difficult people and you have to learn how to deal with difficult people also in your life. So without those challenges, you won't be able to actually have all this excitement actually, but you mm -hmm. have to show respect. One of my philosophy is that do not attack the person, but attack the problem. Sometimes what happens actually is that we begin to attack the person who has created a problem or who may have been somewhat responsible for the problem but do not attack the pro person actually. Try to focus on the problem actually like that. That's what has been my effort actually. Focus on the problem, not attack the person actually. Everybody has problem. So focus on the problem itself actually, not the person itself. Show mm. respect and uh, try to actually generate and create more leaders. The successful leader is one who generates and creates more leaders. And that's why I consider a successful leader is the one who creates and generates more leaders actually like that. That's yeah. what my philosophy is. Well, you mentioned earlier too, the importance of <clears throat> meditation. Um, I'm actually reading this book right now called The Pause Principle. And it mentions how good leaders manage, great leaders pause, great leaders meditate, great leaders take time and don't rush to the quick judgment. So um, obviously, as you were saying, we may have to deal with difficult people sometimes, but more important, more important is to focus on the problem, not the person, and just continue in your fight. So thank you, Dr. Kabor. Gabriel, you said it. Uh, I, I don't think I could compete with those words, what you said. You said it very wisely. Thank you very much for contributing. Of course. Thank you. Something that I've had to deal with and consider, and I'm sure has been experienced by others here, is that dilemma between staying home or in your place of birth to work with the community there or taking a leap and finding yourself jumping from Delhi to Holland to Florida to Toronto and so on. What advice or insight can you give after dec decades of working for the advancement of peace to people who contemplate branching out from the place they called home? Well, that's no doubt another very good and very interesting question. Well, Gabriel, life is a journey and it takes you to a lot of different places and different destinations. Sometimes you have to travel a lot in order to find a destination or something, what you call your niche. Previously, I did actually in India also, I worked at many different places actually over there. And no doubt from India to Holland and from Holland to Florida, from Toronto, and then to Fresno like that. Now in Fresno, I have been here 55 years. So I then decided, yeah, Fresno is a place where I'm going to stay. Though I had had the opportunities, I had the temptation to go at other places 
where I was offered higher jobs and more uh, higher status position like they know, I thought that Fresno is the right place to stay here. I have been here and I have enjoyed, I have raised my children here who grew up over here in Fresno. Mm -hmm. And uh, I am really thankful whatever I have been blessed being in Fresno. I have met a lot of beautiful people in this community. I have a lot of friendships over here. And I also weather in Fresno very much like Punjab weather where I come from. And it is a little bit hot also during summer. In summer, we used to get rains over there, but that's the only thing I miss. Otherwise, it's a very beautiful place to live. Though my wife, actually, when we came, it was a very small village because she come from Mumbai, which is a very big town and a very big city. But Fresno has grown and we have learned how to love and live in this country, uh, in this city. My children actually have grown, actually they went to school here and they are still around with me like that over there. So I feel actually sometimes you have to make a decision, though it is good to get out of your place actually to discover the world. Because you, have, you learn a lot when you go to different places, travel to different countries, and you learn a lot. By traveling, you learn a lot actually in life. That's what has happened in my life actually. Also, I have attended conferences all over in various continents. So I feel actually very blessed that I had this opportunity in my life. But now I think at my age and stage, I am very happy, very contented being in Fresno, raising my family, and also having been at Fresno State for all these the relationship with Fresno has been a very strong relationship. I always say I belong to Fresno State and Fresno State belongs to me. So that's actually the slogan that I always share with other friends and other acquaintances and students also. So Fresno State has been a big part of my life and also not of me, of my family also. My son actually graduated from Fresno State, actually also. Though my daughter did go to UC Davis, but my son did go over here. So he has been a student alumni of Fresno State. So we have a very strong and bond and relationship with Fresno State. Of course. <clears throat> we have a little bit of time left, so maybe enough time for one or two more of my own questions, and then maybe we could open it up to the audience. Um, this next question is sure to be the most challenging, but I'm eager to hear your answer. In your 55 years here at Fresno State, what has been the highlight of your career? Well, uh, I have said briefly, uh, Peace Garden probably is the legacy that I want to leave behind for future generation of students coming to the campus like that. I feel very good when I go around the camp on the campus, I see, see students enjoying the Peace Garden, studying over there, sitting over there. And I have also seen many schools in the Fresno County at around bring their students actually to visit the university and also the Peace Garden. Mm -hmm. I have met quite a few of the young people on the campus in the Peace Garden and they are going from one monument to the other, one statue to the other, and the guide explaining actually to them the life and legacy and the struggle of all these great icons. I think leaving behind these uh, these monuments in the Peace Garden, and I will be gone, but I'm pretty sure these uh, icons will remain there and their work to be shared with the future generation. So these are the people on whose shoulders we are standing right now, to be very honest. I would consider myself being here in this country, working in, at Fresno State is the result of the struggle of Dr. King and Cesar Chavez. So these are the people who worked for all the human rights for all of us. So we are enjoying the fruits of their work, their hard struggles actually that they went through. So I think that their legacy, their struggles need to be shared and kept alive. The young people need to keep in mind what they have done for us. Do not forget what they have done actually. So I think the Peace Garden will be probably something that will be remembered, will remain uh, 
uh, in future. Another thing I want to share about the Peace Garden, this is the only place in this country where you have all these luminaries, these icons of human rights, social justice at one place. You will find the monuments for Dr. King, Gandhi at different, different places, but having all of them at one place, ours is the only university. And I feel very proud, feel very proud of that, that we are the only university where you have all these icons at one place. There is no other place, no other university like that where you have all these icons at one place. So that's another thing I feel very proud. And I think all of you, all of us should feel very proud of that that we are blessed that Fresno State is that institution or a university with these gifts and uh, their legacy of these great leaders that will be remem remembered by the future generations to come. Of course. One more question for me, Dr. Kapoor, and then maybe we'll open it up for a few audience questions. Um, you were quoted as saying the diversity in our culture and community and our community, in addition to positivity, or what has given you energy and will keep you going? A life of service, you belonging to Fresno State and Fresno State belonging to you. What can you say to those, those of us in attendance who dream of a more fair and equitable world for all humans? Thank you, Gabriel, for that. That's a very good question. The diversity is strength. That's actually, I have believed, particularly diversity of various cultures. People, when I came to Fresno State in 67, I think we could count the people from different other minority groups on the campus, about, about 10 or 12 of us, actually. You could count them on fingers like that. And now I see that we have a tremendous amount of diversity on the campus. We have a diversity of faculty. We have diverse students, actually. And it's a, it is something that I, I think it's a great enrichment actually for all these different cultures that are ethnic groups that we have on the campus. They bring that kind of a strength to all of us and we need to celebrate that. And that's what I think the Peace Garden is the place for celebration of diversity. And that's one of the mission of the goal of the Peace Garden is that in, in addition to provide the legacy and the information about the human rights and the great work that these have do, people have done, I think actually they all come from different diverse backgrounds and we need to celebrate those. So celebration of diversity, I think we should continue that. Uh, and the Peace Garden is a major place where all this uh, celebration of diversity should take place actually, I think. Whether it's a black, brown, Asian, whosoever they are, I think they should have their functions and events at the Peace Garden, I would strongly recommend that. So, so diversity of uh, cultures and diversity, celebration of diversity to me is very important actually. And I think we should continue, and we can learn a lot from each other. We need to, we need to learn about from each other. And actually I would like to see, of course this is a mission of my, it has been a dream of my, uh, about the Peace Garden, if we could have a peace wall after Nelson Mandela's statue, I would like to see another uh, memorial come actually to recognize the Native American Indians on this campus. So that's another thing that I'm working on it. I'm meeting with the native faculty and students actually on the campus in a very informal. So we are trying to see that pretty soon actually there is a memorial for Native American Indians actually on this campus. And I would like to see that uh, uh, a peace wall on the peace in the peace garden and the idea behind the peace garden is we cannot actually have memorials in the peace garden for each one of them but we could certainly have a peace wall where we could have a plaque or something actually representing the 60 70 ethnic or cultural groups that we have in our valley in our service area that if we can have those on a peace wall presented actually whether they are monks or Filipinos or any other Asian groups. Actually, we have so much actually, whether they're Italian, actually, if we have a plaque representing the culture, uh, all, all these actually on a peace wall, actually. I have that idea actually, 
and I have to start talking about it on some day with the administration and other people actually that if we have a peace wall, which actually is actually a reflection of all these ethnic and cultural groups on the peace wall actually. So that's how to have a, some kind of a celebration of diversity uh, on our campus like that over there. So I'm glad that you asked this question and I consider diversity is not a diversity. It is a strength that we all need to celebrate on our campus. And more we do that, better it is. Well, I'm going to jump in here. I I have just been touched by all that you've had to share tonight, Dr. Kapoor. And Gabriel, thank you so much for a wonderful interview. Gabriel and I will be uh, staffing the chat if there are people that have questions. We do have one question for you so far. <laughs> from Caio Sarmento, he's a faculty in physical therapy. And he asks, how should people react when they are being victims of violence? Very often the victims of violence will fight back. Is there a way to combat violence with peace when you are the victim? That's no doubt a very good question. Thank you very much for that. Uh, first of all, we have to support the victims. Victims are the survivors. And to me, survivors are heroes. And uh, we should actually respect what they have gone through. We should stand with them, by them, and provide actually whatever help we can. Let us not add more violence to the violence that is already has happened or already going on like that. For that will not solve the problem like that over there. Violence perpetuates violence. And it is uh, very well the experience of many of our leaders like that in order to stop the violence actually. So somewhere we have to put a stop to that actually over there. So first of all, the victims of violence do need our support. We need to stand by them, with them, whatever we can do, whether they are victims of violence at home or in the street or somewhere else like that. So we need to give them our support as much as we can. And now in order to actually correct the violence where it is coming from, that's a very big challenge actually like that. So that will take a lot of work, hard work. And I say that how actually we are going to move from culture of violence to culture of peace and nonviolence. And here, I have here, each year we celebrate Gandhi's uh, uh, celebration. I don't know whether you can see that or not. And you can it is when a, you put it right there. Yep. Yeah. It is a building a culture of peace and nonviolence. Stop the hate, stop the violence. Actually, we have to actually, uh, in not only just one week, actually one day on Gandhi's birthday, throughout the year, we have to start actually observing this as a, how to move from culture of no, uh, violence actually to culture of peace and non-violence actually. That has been my offer, effort actually. That has been my mission actually. And we try to do that when we have celebration of all these uh, great icons in the Peace Garden. This is the message actually we want to share with our young people like that. And I would like to see our schools and teachers can play a very major role. I would like to see the children actually in the elementary school learning about conflict resolution so solving conflicts in a very peaceful manner like that. Now curriculum has developed, has been developed. How to teach each elementary school children actually about conflict resolution, how to resolve peaceful, peacefully all these conflicts actually. If they would learn conflict resolution at an early age, when they grow up, I'm pretty sure they will be very peaceful in resolving the conflicts like that. So somewhere we have to start. Gandhi used to say, I remember his phrase, his word, if you want peace tomorrow, start with the children today. Don't waste your time. And that means that we have to bring this in the curriculum. We have to teach our teachers actually. Teacher education has to include conflict resolution uh, curriculum in the teacher education so that when they go and become teacher in schools, whether they're elementary, junior high or high, that they teach those skills to children actually like that over there. I have that curriculum also with me and our university, we do have that program where we are working on various schools in our district actually, what they call peer mediation program where they are learning 
how to actually teach the, uh, the school children about the peace and conflict actually resolution like that. So if we start that at an early age, hopefully some of these people who become abuser, they will have actually better way of handling the violence and the conflicts in their lives like that. So that is my answer. I don't know whether that really uh, uh, gives the complete answer, but we need to start with the victims. We have to stand by them because they are survivors. And in my opinion, survivors are heroes. And we need to actually respect them, give them as much support as we can. Thank you. That, that is great. Thank you for that. I, I am a true supporter of teaching conflict resolution. And uh, I think your message about starting with our children is, is definitely the priority. Gabe, do you have a final question? Do you want to have this opportunity? It may not. Um... Oh, uh, oh. Godfrey just brought in one. I, I'd like Go to for add. it. Yeah. So this is from one of our faculty, Dr. Kapoor. Uh, Dr. Crawford says, it can feel overwhelming sometimes when we think about all the issues we face in the world. What advice would you give to graduating students and all of us as we set out to make a difference in the world? What's, what's a good piece of advice that we can end the night with? Well, Gabriel, this is very true that we are all overwhelmed actually by the kind of issues and problems that we are experiencing today. Particularly with the coming of this pandemics, which has really changed our life, our lifestyle, actually. It has impacted all of us. It has made things very hard for all of us like that. No doubt about it, actually, over there. I actually have, though I am a vegetarian, but there is a saying, actually, that actually I have heard, how do you eat the big elephant? <laughs> we don't eat the big <laughs> elephant at one like that. There is a saying that we do piece by piece, actually, mm -hmm. like that. So actually, we, we, we let us concentrate on the small, small things and go from small things to bigger things, actually, also like that. Now, for example, in our own community, uh, we have a lot of problem, gang violence, actually, over here. Recently, you may have heard or uh, read in the newspaper that they discovered so many guns, actually, and they conspire, and actually now there's a ghost guns actually are there like that. Now we plan to start on Dr. King's birthday celebration. Uh, I have colleagues whom I have been working with that on Dr. King's birthday actually, we would like to have something actually, bring those guns actually that you have in your home. You don't, we have too many guns in this country, too many guns actually like that to be very honest like that. We have a gun culture actually like that. We have to move from this gun culture to, uh, from the gun violence to the uh, culture of uh, non-violence like that. So we are going to start uh, a project. Now you may be asking that, how to, how do I keep on moving from one project to another world? This is one of my future actually. I have been the founder of the Martin Luther King you know, uh, celebration committee here for the last 30 plus 38 years like that, I have been the member or founding member of that. So this year I'm going to start a project which I'm going to share, share with members of the committee that we ask the members of the community who have guns, to bring those guns and we will destroy those guns and see what we can do with those. Maybe we will ask uh, some of the business people to give them a little short prize and award, maybe $50 coupon or something like that. So let all these guns actually be collected and destroyed, actually. We have too many guns. Can you imagine? I was at a place, at one place, where the young man actually told me that he could get a gun in $8. $8, can you, can you imagine? You can get a gun in $8, and then in this way they get actually into the hands of the young people, actually. That's really something, very, very serious thing that we have. Our mayor is very sensitive to it. Actually, I'm going to reach him also and work with the, the police department also. Then see that all these guns be recovered actually from our neighborhoods actually. There is no place for guns in our culture like that or we should stay away from them. So how to move from gun violence to a culture of peace and non-violence is no doubt a great challenge like that over there. Thank you, Dr. Kapoor. I'd love to 
join you in that mission, as I'm sure a lot of us here would. Um, I think I paid more for my lunch today than an $8 gun. So definitely something worth addressing in our community. Dr. Siebert? Well, I just want to say thank you so much for a lovely evening. Uh, Dr. Kapoor, you bring such wisdom. And Gabe, I am just continued impressed by you and your capacity as a leader, as a communicator. Um, I, we, you are a great representative of our Department of Social Work and the College of Health and Human Services in Fresno State. So thank you for joining us tonight. I, I want to... Oh, I want to highlight a few things that you said that really touched me because I think sometimes we need a little wrap up to take away and, and summarize. So um, we talk about nonviolence, but you talked a lot about love and peace. And I think we all just need to make that more of our vocabulary that because nonviolence means that we're not doing violence, but I guess when my kids were growing up, I always wanted to say, walk, 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 don't run versus don't run, because don't run tells them what we don't want them to do. And I think love and peace tells us what we want people to do is to practice our love and peace versus being nonviolent. And so um, I think we need to spread that message. So thank you for reminding us of that. You mentioned being the change that you wish to see. And that's a message that I've been given throughout my life, but you really you you live it. And so it's so lovely for all of us to see that and watch that happen. But to be reminded that we all get the opportunity to be role models and to be that change of love and peace, not of not nonviolence, but of love and peace and just keep that love and peace close in our heart. Uh, and then I think that a lot of people here heard your message about attacking the problem versus attacking the person. And I think that that's a lovely reminder to us about um, focusing on what, what the issue is, not keeping people separate from the issues. And um, because that's where the love and peace happens is with the people. A couple other things that you said, um, learn a lot by travel. I would say that my family totally agrees with you. Some of our life, best life lessons have been through the travel, both challenging and um, in it, great memories that they've, they've just given us such great experiences. And I think there is always something to learn when we travel and we make ourselves uncomfortable and we go into another environment and explore that. And then the last thing that you just said, and I think every time I will say vegetarian now, I will think about this, is that we eat an elephant piece by piece and that we should all tackle these challenges and struggles in our society a little bit at a time and not think that we're gonna solve it all in one day, but piece by piece doing, living our best life and being that model of, of what we wanna see in the world. And so thank you for sharing your wisdom with us. And I know that you have one last piece of wisdom for us. Denise, I wanted to thank you and also give, and also Amy and uh, Beth actually, all those who have actually helped us to put this event together. I am really very grateful. And particularly, Denise, in short time, I have developed a great respect for you. You have given us a lot of energy and strength by your leadership in the College of Health and Human Services like that. Each time I meet you, I run into you, I always feel very much inspired, actually. Mm -hmm. We very much. You bring that glow, that uh, kind of a feeling, actually, of uh, that you are a true person and uh, want to actually keep us also moving forward. That's just something I really want to say. I admire your presence. It makes a big difference in our life. The last thing I do want to say is nonviolence is not something passive. And my role model of nonviolence mm -hmm. are Dr. King, Gandhi, Cesar Chavez, Mother Teresa, Dalai Lama. These are my role models of uh, uh, they no one is not sitting something that not doing anything, and uh, Gandhi actually was a very active actually in his uh, uh, nonviolent approach like that. And also last thing is the love. Love is another word for nonviolence that I also use. And uh, these days we are experiencing a lot of hatred towards each other like that. Mm -hmm. I always say, love is something like a raindrops on the flames of hatred like that. So love that we should also try to practice and share 
it is like rain drops on the flames of hatred actually so and dr king used to say yes that love can solve everything in the world actually like that these are his words actually so i really believe in that so we need to practice actually and the other thing actually the uh, gave actually had asked me actually what advice we can give to the uh, students the social workers i have here is some statement from dr king and that i would like to say like that service is the most important thing for social workers compassion in their hearts and also respect for others and here is the dr king says everybody can be great because everybody can serve you do not have to have a degree or a college phd to serve you do not have to make your subject and verb to agree in order to serve you only need a heart full of grace a soul generated by love so those are his words actually i think we should keep that because service is the most important thing for social workers and that's what actually gandhi actually said the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others and that has been my motto my actually mission in my life that if if you lose yourself into others actually this is the very powerful words that the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others like that over there so those are the words of gandhi which i would like to share with the uh, all of you and my also mentor sir shavez used to say god help us even to love those who hate us help us to love even those who hate us so that we can serve the world and change the world like that those are the words of gandhi uh, sir shavez i remember those and particularly in these days of uh, hatred that you see as we want to have that kind of a strength and energy that even to love those who hate us actually so that we could serve and change the world actually those are the words that i would like to leave all of you so keep actually those words in your mind all the time in order to serve service is our motto and that what should guide us uh, to all the social workers actually that's all so, thank you gabe so on that note i would ask that we uh, unpin our speakers and we take a minute on the screen to show our own one of the things i love about dr kapoor is every time he comes on the screen he gives me the peace sign yeah. so i would love for us all <clears throat> to put your view in gallery view so that you can see all of our friends on the screen yeah and show your what is your peace sign to the group how do you show peace and so thank you thank you that's very sweet thank you to our team who helped make this happen tonight thank you for our colleagues who joined us and for dr whittle who made this a priority to bring her class and our other faculty who brought students to join us this evening uh that says that we're uh living love and peace by getting these messages to our students to our colleagues on that fine note uh we don't want to take away from our wisdom that dr kapoor shared with us thank you to our team thank you for joining us and go in peace and have a lovely evening